Good afternoon. Welcome to Kansas City, Kansas Public Library. And our educational specialists from FL Schlegel Environmental Library, Patrice, Kristen, and Luann, will tell us all about critters in your garden, the good and the bad. Girls, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. As uh, Elena said, I'm Patrice, and I'll be talking about some specific critters in your garden, which are our mammals in your garden. But first, before I go there, I just want to share a little bit about our special library. It's called Mr. and Mrs. F.L. Schlegel Environmental Learning Library. We are a special library where it's also a nature center. So we have animals. Um, all of our books are specific to the environment, nature, all that kind of stuff. We offer classes, summer camp, and we actually just taught archery today. So it's awesome that you guys are here. And if you wanna come visit us and see some animals that maybe we even talked about today, please do. We're located at uh, Wyandotte County Lake, 4051 West Drive, 66109. So today, my section is going to be on mammals in your garden. And there's going to be good and bad mammals, actually. So first, mammals are a class of mammalia characterized by the prevalence of mammary glands. So females um, produce milk to feed their young. And they have fur, and we have three middle ear bones, which differentiates from the mammals. So like I said, not all animals, in this case mammals, are bad for your garden, but they're predominantly more bad than good. So in my PowerPoint, I'm going to go over the mammals, and you'll learn about the major pests and the ones that are helpful. And the following ones will be, we'll have one over invasive species that will be presented by Kristen, and then one over the good um, pests or good bugs by Luann. So our first animal we're going to talk about, first mammal, is a deer. So Deer will destroy your plants, your trees, your shrubs, anything, actually. Deer love to consume lots of different things. They actually eat over 500 different types of plants. And so if your garden is ac accessible and they found these plants, they're more than likely going to continue to come back and completely destroy your garden. So there are a few different ways that we can kind of de deter the deer from coming into the garden. But a, not, a few other things why it's important to kind of deter deer is deer actually carry different pests on them themselves. They can carry a tick, they carry ticks. They also eat trees, causing tree disease. As they're feeding, they can open up holes in the bark. It weakens the trees, makes it more susceptible to disease. So a few, I think I have six ways we can keep deer out of your garden. Truthfully, if deer want to come in, they're going to come in kind of thing. <laughs> As you can see, they eat almost anything. But we do have some options for like planting deer resistant plants. So there are some, there's really not many that are deer proof, but we have some that are just like, you know, not something deer want to eat. So plants with like prickly foliage or bram brambles, like a, a thistle, that would deter them from eating. Plants with furry leaves like lamb's ears. And then plants with strong scents like rosemary or garlic, they rely heavily on their sense of smell. So if the plant is too pungent, they're gonna avoid that. And apparently deer really, really like hibiscus. So if you have hibiscus, be careful. <laughs> Let's see. And then, of course, you can plant plants that are poisonous or have like really thick sap. If you're going to do that, though, you have to be careful if you have your own critters, your own animals, because you don't want them to eat those poisonous plants. Another option is you can do mass planting. So once the deer know you have food and they have food to eat and they like your food, they're going to continue to come back. But if you were 
to mass plant that would help the deer it would prevent the deer from like browsing around and it allows you to still have like some so example would be let's say you planted hibiscus and you just planted one well that deer ate it but if you plant multiples hopefully the deer will just eat the ones they can get to and not all of them okay so the idea for that is instead of planting like one, you plant multiples and kind of they, eat, they will eat the plants outside of the group and won't go like in the middle to get to all the plants. So you'll still have some blooms, but nowhere near as much as you probably planted. Another way, a third way is to design flower beds with plant blocking. So that means your mass flowers um, you're, you're creating the mass flower plant again, and then you're going to surround them with deer resistant plants. So those spiky, those hairy, those fuzzy plants. Uh, and you want to make sure the border plants are close enough together to form a hedge or large enough to make it difficult for the deer to reach over them. For a fourth one, it, you could install a, a large fence. To really be deer proof though, a fence needs to be eight feet tall and 12 feet, eight feet tall and 12 feet high would actually be better because they can jump really high. If a deer is motivated enough, if they like what plants you have, they will easily get over a six foot fence. They can jump right over. So if you don't have a high enough fence, another option would be to do solid fencing. So it's blocking the deer from sight. So if they can't see what is over there, they're less likely to get into what's over there. And then the last thing is you can plant trees and shrubs inside the fence. This would discourage deer to jump because um, it would, it, you could have a shorter fence. It would, you know, cause them to not have a clear landing. And so they're less likely to jump if they don't have a clear landing. <clears throat> So that's deer. Super cute, but really pesky. All right. Okay, this is moles. I love moles. They're so cute. <laughs> They're actually very delicate creatures and they, this is like, to me, a good pest or a good critter in your garden. They improve your soil. They eat many pests that are actually like in, pest insects and get, they actually get blamed a lot for the hill, the mole hills, what most people think, but they're not causing this damage. There is a quote and it says, moles aren't all bad. In fact, they're 99% good. They aerate soil. They eat mostly grubs, which are undesirable because grubs eat the roots of your grass. They Then they turn into beetles, which feed on your decorative plants. So if there's a mole, more than likely, he's helping you out versus not. <laughs> so this is like what you'll see that people aren't always complaining about if they think, you know, the mole hill is going to create um, an area and just ruin the plants. But if you can, as you can see, there's only one molehill that they'll create and just multiple tunnels. Um, and usually who will create these that'll cause issues are voles. Moles and voles are different and I'll go into that. So this is a vole with a V. These guys drive gardeners crazy. You'll know voles by their snake-like tunnels. And so if you're seeing like multiple tunnels and stuff, that's gonna be the voles, not the moles. A lot of people confuse these guys, but they're completely different. And we'll go over that in a minute. Um, so let me see, sorry. All righty. So for the voles to control in, um, your population, you're gonna want to, you know, look for rock piles, crevices between cliffs, all those kind of things where they're most likely to be found. So here's the difference between voles versus moles. <laughs> a vole is like a, a rodent. It's a mouse-like rodent. Eats all kinds of plants, will burrow underground, will damage your tree and shrub roots, and eat your plants, leaves, stems. Your moles, 
have no eyes or ears, easy to identify by their long nose or big front feet. They eat worms, grubs, insects, and just leave a big mound of dirt behind. And your yard damage is usually underground tunnels everywhere. So who done it? <laughs> a bull or a mole. So you should know, <laughs> you can tell if it's eating the roots and the bulbs, it's probably more of a mole, a vole, excuse me. And if it's eating the grubs and the insects, it's more likely a mole. Okay. Now fox. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. So in many cases, foxes get unnoticed or they're like well, welcome wildlife in gardens and they really usually don't cause much damage, maybe stealing a glove here or there, as you can see. <laughs> um, in some gardens, foxes will trample plants, eat ripened fruit, dig holes or leave droppings and food debris. But you really won't see them much um, like you won't see them much in the urban areas, more in the suburbs. So you probably, if you like live in Wendat County, you probably won't see any fox. But if you lived in Johnson County, you're more likely to. Uh, one way to find fox, or you might see fox unsuspecting, homeowners find them a lot under porches, decks, sheds, or a rather cozy place against the elements of the weather. They're especially true during harsh winters, you will find fox under areas. Um, so if you do happen to find them, what you can do is leave their den alone and create, what is this? Thank you. Okay, create like a lower forest canopy because some foxes can climb when you're on the garden. So <laughs> you wanna create like either trees or shrubs more likely the fox won't climb around that. So since foxes are, they're solitary creatures, you probably won't see more than one if you do have, uh, and they're not that prevalent in our area. So you probably won't see fox very often. And they are not afraid to wander though into human territory. So just look out for that. Okay, so our next one's gonna be raccoons, these cute guys. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I put like foods that they eat on every single one. And I was like, oh, raccoons love to steal eggs. So <laughs> I cooked some eggs there for him. <laughs> so even though raccoons prefer areas with trees and a source of water, they are raiding gardens because gardens are easy food sources of food. Raccoons are lazy. I mean, they're smart, you know, they work smarter, not harder. <laughs> so to discourage raccoons from visiting your yard, you could stow water or food supplies such as pet bowls and bird feeders out of reach at night because they will come eat that food and know that you have food. So they'll continue to come back. Some homemade repellents could be helpful. Um, one example of a successful repellent is baby powder or bone blood meal on vegetables and corn ears. So, and then raccoons are true omnivores. So they eat variety of foods. They'll eat nuts, seeds, fruits, eggs, insects, frogs, crayfish, all that. And they'll eat whatever is available because they are very dexterous that they can just, you know, pluck morsels out. So just trying to keep food away from them is probably the best thing to do. <laughs> he looks so cute there. Okay, and now we have squirrels. I'm sure we have lots of squirrels around. Um, squirrels, I'll talk about chipmunks a little bit next, but squirrels and chipmunks are known to look for insects or other goodies in containers. They may uproot plants in the process. If conditions have been dry, they may also dig to find moist soil. They will not, only, squirrels will not only attack your gardens, but feeders as well. So if you have bird feeders, they will get into that stuff too. So trying to make sure that's out of reach might be hard on a tree though for the bird feeder. So one thing that you can do is squirrels have a strong sense of smell. So they use, um, you can repel them by using scents they hate. And some scents they hate would be capsaicin 
white vinegar, peppermint oil, coffee grounds, cinnamon, a predator's urine. So I don't know if you ever heard that, but you could get like, you can buy it. It's interesting, like coyote urine or something and pour it around your garden. Dryer sheets, they hate the smell of dryer sheets. <laughs> and Irish spring soap and rosemary. So there's lots of different options <laughs> for you to make it smelly good for us, but not for them. All right, and here is our cute little chipmunk. They kind of look like squirrels. They're much smaller squirrel-like rodent native to North America. They, we might not see many here because they reside, well, yeah, I mean, we do sometimes. They reside in the far Eastern portion of Kansas in Oak Hickory woodlands, as well as suburban neighborhoods. And they, and how you can tell, like it's a chipmunk, they have five dark strips or stripes and two stripes along their reddish gray and brown bodies. So same thing as squirrels, chipmunks too have a lot of sensitive smells that they do not like. So one would be if you wanted to add some spice by sprinkling cayenne, chili powder, or something else hot, spicy. Intense spices around your garden makes it a, an easy, non-toxic way to discourage chipmunks and not affect any other animals or insects. So gardeners have reported success deterring chipmunks also with a generous sprink sprinkling of medicated powder. So just again, like the baby powder. <laughs> okay, let's see. And then here are the chipmunk versus squirrel. So a chipmunk is striped, rodent comparatively smaller, confined to North America, have quite shorter tails, if you can see, than squirrels. They're warm, brown in color. They mainly feed on fungi, seeds, fruit, nuts, eggs, small insects, caterpillars, and even young snakes. They go into hibernation and during the warm season chipmunk stuff every extra food into their cheeks, which is super cute. That's where you get those chipmunk cheeks from. <laughs> and so they are full and then they carry the food to their home. And then squirrels um, is a tree dwelling, dwelling rodent with a bushy tail, much longer, found all over the world except for the polar regions. It's much, it's larger in size, large bushy tail. They, we have a variety of different kinds, black to gray, red and brown. They to eat berries, mushrooms, nuts, all that. They don't hibernate and they store food for the cold season and spend the winter snug in their nests. <laughs> all righty. So this guy, I'm almost done. We got lots of animals, a lot of mammals for y'all. So I just want to try and reach everyone. <laughs> so this guy, a woodchuck is what I call them, also known as a groundhog groundhog so you know groundhog day kind of thing that's this guy so they are prolific diggers they are really adept at getting through fences for it to be a true barrier you would have to like bury the fence and use chicken wire or other materials that won't rot 10 to 12 inches into the ground to prevent woodchucks they're mainly vegetarians, so they feed on grasses, chickweeds, clover, plantains, cultivated flowers, blackberries, raspberries, cherries, fruits, and bark of hickory and maple trees. I actually had one. I have. A, I live in a very forested area and have a lot of guys. These little guys come out. They look huge. A lot of people think they are beavers, but they're not. I will compare them right here. So we have a groundhog versus a beaver. So a groundhog spends most of their time in the ground, right? Beavers majority in water. Groundhogs are three kilograms versus, I don't know what that translates into for pounds, so I'm sorry, but as you can see, the beaver is much larger. It's 32 kilograms, and I think they can get up to like 40 pounds at least. The groundhog has a short and fluffy tail, while the beaver has a, a flat, wide tail. So here's your groundhog, the woodchuck guy, versus the beaver. You can even see like the feet are different. The beavers are webbed for the water. 
All right. Okay, everybody loves this guy, right? The possum. <laughs> All right, even though a possum may pose an occasional threat, do we have some questions in the chat? Sorry, I saw some people chatting. Oh, okay, multiply by 2.2, thanks guys. <laughs> Much bigger than I thought then, okay. So the possum, it is a threat to gardens, have fruits and vegetables, but they tend to prefer plant matter that is starting to rot. So actually they could be like a positive, a good critter in your garden. So the chances are they'll help clean it up uh, rather than clean out your garden. And then this is my last one. I think these are cute. It reminds me of Cinderella, the mice in Cinderella. I had to of course talk about mice because you know, mice are everywhere. If there's humans, there's mice. <laughs> and I know it's getting, it's what, today's the last day of summer or tomorrow. It's gonna start getting cooler. You'll probably get more mice come inside looking for warmth. Um, you just may unfortunately have to learn to live with them. They are bothersome, they're costly because they can contaminate a great deal of food um, from our crops to our cupboards. They chew holes and wires and destroy houses. So should you be concerned about mice in your garden? It's not unusual for them to be in your garden, especially if you have a ready supply. So if you wonder like, will this mice eat my vegetable garden? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> mice are optimistic and vegetable and opportunistic, sorry. And vegetable damage is one of the most common mouse garden problems. So to be able to um, deter your mice you would want to clean up your yard make sure you don't have wood piles or tall grass or fallen leaves which are perfect places for them to hide remove exposed food bird food pet food and trash are also potential food sources for rodents and you could set you know traps or cover burrow openings inspect your home or proper pest control Okay, and so this is my last one, and then I'm going to hand it over to Kristen, who's going to talk about the bad guys in your garden. Thank you, Patrice, for that lovely info on mammals. Let me add one more fun fact about mammals unrelated to your gardens. But hey, if you have house cats in your house, you can also spray like uh, chili powder or like citrus on your furniture and it'll get your cats to stop scratching your furniture so that's another good you know indoor pest <laughs> repellent just kidding just kidding House could you pet. repeat what to sprinkle like uh you can use chili powder or like chili peppers um and uh, or like a citrus spray and it'll stop your cats from scratching your furniture if it smells like those things because they don't like those smelly things either for some reason i guess it's a small mammal thing i don't know but anyway um yeah, so thanks for handing it over. My name is Kristen Mannion. I'm another education specialist here at the Schlegel Library. And our next two sections are going to be the good and the bad guys in your garden. And my section here is about the bad guys. But again, I want to kind of like preface with the fact that uh, what good and bad means is really based on like what your goals and your intentions are, right? So um, if you want a really diverse and productive a home garden, then perhaps these things that I'm about to talk about are bad guys. But again, it's sort of just like your perspective and it's also about time. It's also about where your garden is. Um, so just keep that in mind as I talk about what I'm gonna talk about next. So invasive species, that is what I will be discussing as far as a few quote, bad things um, in your garden, but especially in the context of like having garden here in North America and in the eastern part of the United States, these uh, critters or pests that I'm going to talk about, these insects, have caused and will cause a lot of damage. So let me explain a little bit about what I mean when I say something is an invasive species. 
So we hear this word, I think, uh, tossed around a lot, like in the news media, or at least like for us working in these different like conservation circles, we get this idea that an invasive species is this really, really big, negative, bad critter of some kind, um, who is sort of like a foreigner in a new land, right? So an invasive species is any sort of animal um, or plant that has been introduced into a new environment. And when I say something is a new environment, I mean like in this time scale of like, it has been um, spread from its homeland to a new place um, by human cause, by some sort of human cause. Um, and so like, if we think about it, like over lots of time, uh, like evolutionary history, like, millions and millions of years ago, the things that are native here now would have been considered invasive maybe a long time ago, right? So it's kind of, again, shifting about perspective, but again, just like keeping in mind what, what we're talking about um, specifically today. But invasive species are new to an environment and they have to be harmful, at least according to these three things here. So harmful to human health, to our economy or to ecosystem health. And then the last thing is that they have to be able to be spread very, very quickly in that new environment to be considered an invasive species. So there are lots of different things that kind of define um, what is and is not an invasive species. So any new plant or animal in a new environment isn't necessarily going to be invasive. One, if it doesn't fit one of those three categories from before, but they also have to have certain traits that make them be able to thrive and survive in this new environment. I've listed some of those traits here. Um, examples include uh, being able to really quickly reproduce, being able to make a lot of babies and offspring in a short period of time, um, having traits that are advantageous to their new environment or um, in ways that might outcompete um, the native species in that environment. And they also tend to be things that are really hard to, um, to, to manage, to take care of, right? So um, they might have things like, they might produce chemicals that alter their environment to make it more hospitable for them to survive. Um, or they might just not have a lot of things that eat them or come after them. So not a lot of predators. Um, and by life history traits, I mean the things that invasive species have that they can pass on to the next generation um, through reproduction. Those are like the traits that I'm talking about here. We'll go to the next one. Thank you. No. Yeah, but a couple of things too. Like I, I have to mention this because this is sort of like part of the framework of how we're talking about invasive species is that it has a lot to do with like context. And when people use the word invasive, it can be kind of seen as sort of problematic. And there are lots of different perspectives on this in the scientific community. Um, and also, you know, something that's an invasive species can often be really, really hard to manage. And so at what point does it become something we just have to accept that it's here now? Um, and we sort of just have to learn how to live in like a new ecosystem or like a new environment with this species. But anyway, this is more of a sidebar here. If you're ever interested in talking about invasive species, I would love to talk about them with you. Um, but for the most part, just know, like in the larger scientific context, um, it's it's complicated, I guess, is what I should say. That's like the whole summary of my talk here is like it's complicated. But anyway, we'll keep going. <laughs> so the first uh, creature I'm going to talk about today is the Japanese beetle. I actually think that they are very pretty and I've read about and heard of, maybe it was from Luann who told me actually, that people um, make jewelry out of them because um, they're, they're, you know, their exoskeleton is so shiny and pretty. And I have to agree, it is pretty. But if you've got Japanese beetles in your garden, you're probably not a happy, happy camper. Because if you take a look 
at this picture on the right, you can see that a whole swarm of beetles here has skeletonized these leaves. And um, skeletonized, what that means is that they have eaten essentially every part of the plant leaf except for the veins. And so you leave behind this sort of like spooky leaf. And so if you've got Japanese beetles in your garden, um, you might end up with some plants looking like this, and that's probably not so good for you, the gardener, right? Another problem with the Japanese beetle is they will eat a lot of different plants. They don't have like a specific host plant. They're kind of like a, called a generalist, so they'll eat pretty much anything. So, you know, um, you know, they might like your tomatoes one day, and then they like, I don't know, your goldenrod the next day or something. Um, so, What's, what's challenging about when once you have them in your garden is that um, pretty much anything is a feast for them. Um, uh, let's see. They were introduced here from Japan in the early 1900s. That's where they get the name the Japanese beetle. But there's actually a native species um, called um, the green beetle, which is about uh, looks a lot like it, but it's about twice in size. So um, if you see green beetles in your garden, those are good. We want to keep those here, but the Japanese beetle, that could really do some damage to your plants. Um, but the only challenge with the Japanese beetle is there's not really, and as you'll hear me talk about with these other, quote, bad insects, there's not a very good um, way to manage these creatures once you've got them where you don't want them. But one thing I will say about the Japanese beetle is they're really easy to spot. So let's say you had them in your garden, you could probably maybe go in and just pick off as many as you could find, and that could help um, with controlling them in your garden. But I also have heard that you can control them with other chemicals like uh, Patrice mentioned earlier with peppermint oil that Japanese beetles also do not like peppermint oil. So if you sprayed that on your plants or on the soil around some of your plants um, that they might be eating, that could be a good deterrent um, for the Japanese beetle. But I've never done that before, so I can't say firsthand if that would work or not. But you, once you pick them off, maybe you can give them to somebody and somebody can make beautiful green <laughs> beetle jewelry for you. <laughs> okay. So our next creature I'm going to talk about is the brown marmorated stink bug, or uh, abbreviated as BMSBs. BMSBs, boo. Okay, you guys, I'm sure you've seen these. Maybe yeah, look, yeah, we landed thumbs down, thumbs down. BMSB bugs. The brown marmorated stink bug is. Um, quite a problem, especially here again in uh, the eastern part of the United States um, that I would consider Kansas City to be eastern. We're more eastern than western. Um, but the usually I think people actually see these not in their gardens but inside their homes in the winter um, because they need a warm place to overwinter in the winter time. Um, these guys were introduced um, uh, you know, the same way a lot of invasive species are introduced, they were introduced through plant imports from Eastern Asia a really long time ago, and they've just established and populated and they're, they don't have a natural predator here in the US, and so they just keep growing and growing and growing. But the, the part about the stink bugs that's bad is that they have this um, sucking mouth part. So. If you guys know what an aphid is, or if you know what um, a cicada is, they have similar mouth parts, which it looks literally just kind of like a straw. Sorry, my finger is not a straw, but it looks like a straw and they stick that straw either into the xylem or the phloem of a plant, which those are like the transport um, centers in the plant, right, for how they move their nutrients around in their plant bodies. And these BMSBs will suck out those nutrients or they'll put holes in um, that really important um, structures of the plants, which will make it really hard for the plant to be able to efficiently move the things around in their bodies that they need. Um, and, but also another thing, 
about them that's pretty undesirable. They really like to eat some of our most um, delicious like orchard like trees that you might have in your garden. So things like peaches, apricots, persimmons, mulberries. If you got, get these guys on those trees, you could end up having a lot of problems. Um, simply because those that's the type of stuff they like they really love those things um another unfortunate thing about them is they are a stink bug so if you go out and you want to squish them they are very um smelly and they do not smell good and i've smelt one being squished before and man it is not pleasant and i actually read today preparing for this talk that some people are allergic to this compound that they make when they make their stinky smell so you know I guess if you are particularly like uh don't love that smell maybe you have an allergy to it I mean I don't know but anyway sorry another tangent there but um one thing about them though is again um while they do reproduce quickly and they can cause a lot of problems because they're larger they would be easier to maybe physically pick off if you found them. Um, I've read about people using handheld vacuums to vacuum them off of trees before. I've never done this, um, but I, you know, you go out and do it and report back and let me know how it goes. Uh, I would be curious to see how effective that is. Um, yeah, so that's the BMSBs. Yay. Okay, next up, not necessarily an insect, more of a critter, okay, um, but I've got here, we're going to talk a little bit about jumping worms, which I know jumping worms were the, like, whole impetus for this talk, right, Elena, like, yes, yes. okay, well, I'm sorry it's become just one slide, but I do have to say that jumping worms are really, really interesting, and uh, really uh, also bad for your garden, <laughs> so um jumping worms are uh, another non-native species of worm they're native to eurasia um but they have been imported here to the u.s again through like plant materials being moved around um but the problem with them the jumping worms is that they aren't like our typical earthworms that we have here in north america Earthworms here in North America are good for the soil because they aerate the soil. They also deposit nutrients back into the soil. Um, regular earthworms, non-jumping worm earthworms can be really positive. But the problem with the jumping worms is that they are so efficient at getting and extracting the nutrients from the soil that they will turn your soil into sort of like a uh, a fungal or bacterial wasteland, okay? So they turn your soil into just dirt without any of the good stuff in it, you know? And who wants dirt with no good stuff? I mean, seriously, like dirt with nothing good in it, not not ideal, okay? When you see jumping worms um, kind of like take over a garden, the soil will look a lot like ground up, um, like coffee beans or, um, yeah, kind of like ground up coffee beans. Um, or uh, also someone described it as like cooked ground beef, which I think those things look different. So I'm not really sure um, what that means exactly. Maybe you can get one or the other, you know, depending on the type of soil you start with, right? Okay, good question. Patrice asked, do they jump? Well, they're given that name because they are very, very wriggly. So they do move around a lot compared to like, um, you know, many people go fishing with the night crawlers, which you can see here is a picture of. They're very wiggly too, but the jumping worms do like more, I would call it more violent thrashing about compared to your average earthworm or sorry, native earthworm to North America. Um, another problem with them is that they reproduce really quickly. So their um, generation times are really, really fast. They don't follow the same cycle that our earthworms do. So, you know, if you get a lot of them in an area really fast, it can really do bad things to your soil and your garden. And your soil is the most important part of your garden, right? Um, uh, one good way, so once you've got them in your garden, it's hard to get rid of them. 
Um, you can go in and maybe hand pick them out the same way I've talked about these other bugs. Um, but really what you want to do is prevent them from getting there in the first place. So one thing that you can do is if you garden in more than one place, make sure that you're cleaning your gardening tools between the places that you're going and also cleaning your shoes in between maybe when you're hiking versus when you're gardening because you can get lots of different um, bad pathogens transported that way. People don't think about that but that's actually um, there's this disease that's killing a lot of amphibians that we think um, was transported on people's shoes. This disease it's called chytridomycosis. It's really bad for a lot of frog populations but scientists determined that that bad fungus was spread because people weren't cleaning their shoes in between uh, places they were traveling. So um, that's another way to prevent at least jumping worms from getting into your garden. And then, yep, next. Yep, thank you. And then the last one I'm going to talk about, which is not a problem here yet, but I'm telling you guys, give it two or three summers, maybe even next year, it's going to be here the spotted lanternfly, okay? If you are on um, any type of like, well, I'm tapped into like weird conservation channels, um, but people that I know that live out east have seen at this bug and hate it. And it is going to be a huge problem if or when it gets here. Um, because the spotted lantern lanternfly, a lot like that brown marmorated stink bug, um, has a sucking mouth part that can really destroy um, trees and plants in your garden. But also its other problem is that it likes a lot of different things. So part of the issue with a lot of these invasive species is that they're like what we call generalists. They like to eat and destroy lots of different things. And um, that's the problem here too with the spotter, la spotted lanternfly. And also the other problem is that people think it's really pretty. They see it and they're like, wow, that bug is really cool looking. And I have to agree, I think it's cool looking too, but it's not supposed to be here and it's going to cause a lot of problems eventually. Um, so keep out for this one in your garden, maybe you know on the horizon in a few years. <laughs> but last thing, and just to wrap up the bad, things from our garden. Um, a lot of folks um, might decide that using insecticides or using pesticides is good for managing these pests in your garden, but um, there are a lot of um, like adverse effects to using those things. So while an insecticide might kill off the things you don't like, it could also kill the things that you really want to keep in your garden, which Luann is going to talk about here in a moment. Um, and um, there's a lot of harm being done to native good species of bugs because of the use of these things. So I would encourage you, instead of using those things to manage pests in your garden, um, consider planting lots of diversity of types of plants and also um, doing your best to prevent getting pests in the first place. So that's all I have to say about the bad in your garden. And I know we said Luanne was gonna talk about this next part, but we're transitioning now to the good guys in your garden. And I selfishly have to talk about this first good guy here in our garden because uh, I actually studied these guys for my master's thesis, but our first good guy, and Luann, I'll let you go into the details about the other good guys, but the first group of good guys that I want us to mention are ground nesting bees, okay? So those little tiny holes that you see pop up in the really sandy parts of your garden where there's a lot of bare open soil, those are probably the homes of lots of ground nesting bees or maybe ground nesting wasps too, which I know Luann will talk about wasps in a moment, but I'm going to focus on bees. So the bees that live underground, and I know it's kind of surprising sometimes when I tell people that some bees live underground, um, but these types of bees are not like honeybees and they're not like... Um, they're not like honeybees, they don't live in a hive, they live individually in these underground um, nests. But what they do is they're really, really, really effective and really good pollinators for a lot of native plant species. They're also really good at pollinating fruits and vegetables. 
So having some areas in your garden that are good for ground nesting bees would be a hu uh, like a humongous help to having a really diverse and um, proficient garden. And so if you have some areas where the ground is kind of open um, for the bees to be able to build nests, that's a really great way to help promote um, this type of bee. And again, these bees being very small and living underground are really susceptible to those pesticides and the insecticides. And so that's why we want to, uh, or I'm going to suggest encouraging you maybe not to use those things uh, as far as managing your garden. But anyway, that's all I have to say. Ground nesting bees, good guy for your garden. I'm going to hand it over to Luann. All right, thank you, Kristen. Uh, my name is Luann Cadden, and I'm an education specialist here. I've been here about five years, and I love to garden. So um, come out and visit us. We actually have a lot of beautiful uh, native plant gardens right around our library, well, where you will see a lot of these different insects that we talked about today, hopefully mostly the ones that are doing the good in your garden. So when we talk about the good insects, and like we said, all insects do have a purpose. So there's always a little good in everybody. Um, these are the ones, these insects, the ladybugs, are usually the first ones that people think about. Everybody hears about, oh, you can go buy ladybugs um, at the nurseries and bring them to your yard and they'll eat all the aphids. And uh, they, some people say that you put them in there and then they immediately fly away. <laughs> And that's true. They might do that. There are some um, tricks to actually keep your ladybugs around. One is to um, kind of moisten the leaves before you release the ladybugs, like if you get them from somewhere else. Um, but the reason we love the ladybugs is they eat aphids like crazy. Um, and the aphids are those little guys, like Kristen was uh, mentioning, with the piercing mouths that will pierce the leaves, the stems of your plants and just pull all that moisture and all the good juice right out of your plants. So she's gonna go along and eat those. What you don't usually notice about the ladybugs is their younger life cycle period, their larva right here and uh, the ladybug nymphs, which look like that is what you're seeing in that lower picture. So the yellow is their eggs. And on the right to the eggs are the uh, black and yellow. That's the earlier stage of a ladybug as it goes through um, transformations there. So that little guy is the one that most people will see that on their plants and go, ew, I don't know what that is, but I'm gonna kill it. So if you see these little guys and they're a little bit smaller than your ladybug, but some are about the same size, um, leave them alone. You can do more um, research on the different uh, colors that they can be, but but um, they will be all over, and you can even see some smaller ones on that leaf too. But that's usually the the stage of the ladybug that people aren't familiar with. That I hear that they go, oh, I had these nasty little things on my leaves, and so I killed them. I'm like, no. <laughs> so um, so know that they don't always look like that adult stage that are always the the red with the spots on it. That they will change, and they're they're actually voracious little eaters um at that other stage too all right so we're gonna look at some more beetles uh everybody loves the beetles uh b-e-a-t-l-a-s and b-e-e-t-l-e-s so um but uh beetles are voracious eaters they're lovely to have in your garden there are so many and this part of my slideshow could have been very very long because there are quite a few good insects for your garden I'm just picking out a few of the ones that you're most likely to see. So the one on the left at the top, the hairy one, that's George. No, I'm just kidding. That is a rove beetle right there. Uh, rove beetles love mites, aphids, nematodes, fly eggs, and maggots. Need I say more? He's very helpful. We like to have him around. So uh, a lot of the beetles are predators like he is, and they will eat the other insects that we are not so... Um, happy about. But other beetles are pollinators, going back to what Kristen said too. A lot of our insects are very helpful pollinators. Um, we often think of bees and butterflies as, as great poll pollinators, which they are, but a lot of other insects are too, including um, the uh, soldier beetle right here that's on the bottom. Um, it's that beautiful orange and black color. Thank you. I love this circle right there. Um, 
these are the guys that you're going to be seeing anytime. You could be seeing them in your garden right now. They're late season beetles. So insects will hatch out at different times of the season. Um, these soldier beetles will be coming out now. You'll often see them on goldenrod um, and asters, which are about to bloom right now too. Um, both the adults and the larvae of these beetles are voracious eaters, eating all the little aphids and all the other little things too. So they're both great pollinators and they're great predators on the tough ones. So. Yay for the beetles, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we're ready for our next. Okay, so uh, this is the guy right here that everybody was like, ooh, creepy. Um, but uh, I guess a lot of people are about that with ball bugs, but the mantids, so praying mantis right there on the bottom. This one actually doesn't make me as happy. Yes, they are uh, ferocious, but it's eating a spider, which I'm like, don't eat the spiders. We need those in our garden too. So, so please leave the spiders in your garden. They are awesome. Um, but that just shows you how ferocious and how they do use those uh, front legs to grab their prey. And uh, it's it's kind of funny, really, praying could be spelled two different ways. I always thought that because he looks like he's in prayer, you know, as he's waiting for the insects to come so he can get them. But he is also a predator. So really, it could be P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, too. Um, they are amazing little guys. But I want to show you one problem we have like people might go okay i'll leave them alone i'll let them eat the other bugs but they might accidentally be throwing away the praying mantis eggs and not knowing it when they're cleaning up their garden in the fall so this is a time of year uh, a lot of our plants are dying off and everybody especially if we're in a neighborhood uh, we want to make our yards look clean right so we're cutting down all the stems and the leaves and we're a lot of people, you know, I don't have a compost area or I don't live in the country. I can't just toss it. And they're bagging it all up and letting it get hauled away. Well, the problem with that is, we'll talk more about this later too, that you might be throwing away their egg sacs. And I'm going to hold this up. There we go. Does that work? Yep, that works. This is called the Uthaka. And this is, it gives a good idea about the size. This is the praying mantis egg sac. Um, they will, it starts off uh, kind of creamy and foamy, and then the foam will harden up. It's almost like meringue now is what it feels like. But uh, they'll attach it to a stem in the fall, put all their little babies in there, and this will sit there throughout the winter. So it's going through the whole process. They're all protected in the winter. In the spring, all these little guys or tiny little ones will hatch out. Look how this one's, they're even smaller than this. This is a little guy here, <laughs> but they are so tiny and they look exactly like the adults. Um, so if you're throwing away your stems, you're throwing away their lovely egg sacs that will carry all these wonderful, helpful uh, mantids. There's another type of an egg case. This is a different type of mantid. It's a smaller one, but you might've seen these before. Um, kind of flat on this side. But, and these usually are found maybe on rafters, on the side of a porch, on the side of your siding of your house. Uh, it's more of a flat one rather than on the stem. It's a good one too, and leave it. Uh, people, and we'll talk more about how to make your yard look tidy and keep those helpful stems around toward the end of our program there. Lace wings, they're beautiful, aren't they? Um, so once again, their larva look very different than the adults with the wings there. And even though they look a little scary, kind of like our ladybugs, um, they are huge um, predators of, of uh, aphids and more. Where would you find these? So mostly that uh, the lace wings will lay their eggs on tall, slender stalks. And once again, this time of year, um, the sunflowers, especially in Kansas, our state flower, the sunflowers are blooming like crazy. And that is one place where a lot of the lace wings like to lay their eggs. So if you're cutting down the old dead sunflowers, just if you can cut them down and just leave the stalk somewhere, don't bag them up or you've bagged up all that good larva right in there too. All right. Uh, I know I can't see hands, but Anybody out there seen the caterpillar like that on your tomato plant? I can raise my hand. 
Yes. So in fact, I pulled one of these caterpillars off of my tomato plant. I pulled, pulled three off this year total. Um, this is a tomato hornworm caterpillar. And what you're seeing, the white little things on its back are parasites from wasps. Now, when we think of wasps, we're thinking, once again, you know, I'm, those can't be good for anything. Actually, wasps are pretty good pollinators too, um, but they are great at um, parasitizing other bad insects like these types of caterpillars. Not all caterpillars are great. Um, these types of caterpillars that will defoliate your tomato plants. And there's other uh, caterpillars out there that will defoliate other types of good um, good crops that you have out there. So pretty much the wasp will sting the caterpillar, lay its egg inside the caterpillar. Um, they grow on it and it will end up kind of like just consuming that caterpillar. So um, when you see something like this, what I've been told is it, you know, some people are like, oh, the poor baby caterpillar. <laughs> I'm going to go pick off all the the little eggs on there. Um, that caterpillar is still going to attack your plant. So um, I usually just remove the whole caterpillar and put him out somewhere else besides my tomato plant um, in the back. But uh, but wasps do have actually that purpose in kind of helping our crops and and uh, in wildlife. We know sadly it's it's usually you're trying to find something to eat or you're trying not to be eaten. So that's what we often see out there um, in the wild when this happens here. Flies, and then people are like, ew, flies. Well, besides our, um, our house fly that drives us crazy, there are some really good flies out there. Um, the one on the top that looks sort of like a bee is called a hover fly. Um, their larvae, once again, are great for eating lots of aphids. And the adults, like this one on the flower there, are great pollinators. So if you see this guy in your backyard, he's actually a fly, not a bee, and a very helpful one at that. So leave, let him be, I should say. Oh, no, no, no pun intended, really. Okay, the guy on the bottom left with the green background, that's a robber fly. And look at his eyes are awesome there. The robber flies actually are predators that will drop and land on their prey. So you might see this is kind of cool in action out in your yard when they drop down to catch their prey. And on the right, you'll see that I do have one of those Japanese beetle pictures like Kristen was talking about, the Japanese beetles. So if they're out there attacking uh, your plants, I can say right now I have uh, green bean plants and they will defoliate the leaves of your green beans and, and just kill off your green beans. Um, they even moved on to my marigolds, which most people say are, oh, Nothing will eat a marigold, uh, your Japanese beetles will. Um, but the robber flies uh, love Japanese beetles. So if you have a problem with Japanese beetles in your garden um, and you see a robber fly, then you're very lucky that he'll be, he'll be helping out that way. All right, true bug. So if you look at that bug on the left, the one that's all brown, that looks a lot like that stink bug that Kristen was talking about. There are some bugs that are lookalike bugs in your garden. You'll find multiple ones, but this is one of them. Uh, there's one bug called a spined soldier bug that preys on things. Now it does eat the same way as the stink bug, so it does pierce them. But really check your insects out. Um, there's, we here at Schlegel have some really good insect field guides that you can check out and look and, and determine if this is, which one this is. Um, also online, uh, you can go to some great online field guides. Um, if you guys aren't sure um, if it's a reputable site, um, let us know. Definitely don't just Google and go to the first site because um, just like Wikipedia type thing, some people will put out pictures like, oh, I'm sure it's this or I'm sure it's that. And it might not be. So um, we usually recommend sites that are organization sites that are reputable um, to go to, to look that up. But this guy, once again, he's good, incredible predator, but he will kill some of your good ones too. Um, uh, ladybugs and things like that. But he's great for eating grubs, the gypsy moth caterpillar, cabbage loopers too. The one on the bottom is our wheel bug. 
and you can kind of see kind of on his back there, it looks like a, a wheel, a spiky wheel. They look scary and I will say don't handle them um, because when they pierce, they will actually cause a reaction on, on human skin too. So don't try, try to pick them up. You can see he's eating a caterpillar there. Um, he's similar to the, uh, uh, the soldier bug that um, he's eating caterpillars. But the caterpillar that he's eating right there is the kind that will defoliate trees. So like once again, not all caterpillars turn into beautiful butterflies. Some are moths and other creatures that will completely take down a tree uh, before it does anything else. All right, so we got a couple slides left and, and now we've got all our beautiful plants. So going back to how do you keep these beneficial insects in your garden? Uh, Kristen touched on this when she mentioned have a diverse uh, a diversity in your garden, lots of different types of plants. That's going to help you. Um, different predators are going to, different insects will be drawn to different plants. So you're not going to have too much of one insect if you have different plants. If you have all like a monoculture or one type of plant, that's when sometimes you can get into trouble because you're going to get all one kind of insect. Diversity, also plan your gardens where you have different blooms throughout the season. So you have some in the spring, summer, and fall, um, and that will add that to that diversity. And we out here at Schlegel definitely promote native plants. Um, all flowering plants can be great for pollinators, but native plants are very resilient. Um, there's actually been studies that the nectar from native plants to wherever you live are actually healthier for the insects than the other introduced plants. And our last slide here is similar to what I said before, leave the leaves. Um, if you can, do not bag up your plant debris in the fall. Um, one thing you can do if you live in a residential neighborhood, urban area, um, when you cut your stems, like say your plants, like I gotta do this actually tomorrow, go out, some of our flowers have you know, bloomed and they're looking pretty dry and crispy. I'm gonna cut them down and leave about 12 inches of height. And the reason I'm gonna leave that is those hollow stems are excellent places for bees and other insects to overwinter. So you're leaving them a little bit. So you're still making it look kind of nice and uniform by it's a straight little cut maybe, um, but you're leaving a little bit. If you don't know where to put all your debris, you're like, okay, I just need to cut this down because it looks bad. You could put it under bushes, um, shrubs, or make a little brush pile in the back of your yard. And then those good insects are able to overwinter in your yard. And then in the spring, they'll hatch out. It's pretty safe to completely get rid of that um, debris after it's warmed up to like 60 degrees consistently for the rest of the year. You can just get rid of it then. Everything should have been hatched out. So um, grow native. And uh, we, once again, all those insects um, have a special purpose. But uh, if you have any questions about them too, please give us a holler. And I'm gonna let Patrice hop back in here. Oh, I gotta tell one more thing, sorry. <laughs> Another book plug here. Let's see, there it is. Good bugs for your garden. We actually have this here at Schlegel. They might have the other branches too, but excellent one to check out. Plus we've got a lot of other great insect books, but I saw this one, I love it. Questions? Well, I have one. Do we have any questions? Hello, am I muted? Chat. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, for some reason, when Patrice was talking, uh, she wasn't being um, heard through the 
through the Zoom, but just wanted to add that um, thank you guys for coming. And if you have other questions, uh, feel free. You can always email us, and I've dropped our email here in the chat. And I just asked you a question through the chat. Oh, okay. So uh, there are these yellow bugs that look like soldier bugs. I thought they were uh, fireflies, but they're not. So they are kind of yellowish and they have two black spots on their bodies closer to the end, to the rear end. I, we can double check on that, but I believe those are still <laughs> the, everywhere. The, good, the good ones that I was talking, yes, the good soldier bugs that are on the goldenrod. There are also, I want to say there is oh, goldenrod beetle. Goldenrod beetle. Check also the cucumber beetle looks a lot like that um, yellow with black spots on it but um, those are okay too unless yeah. you have cucumbers so. mm -hmm. and once again th that is a good one i do know elena for sure they everywhere same. in the garden it looks like we, they they like pollen yes exactly those are the ones you're going to find on the goldenrod i think people call them slang as a goldenrod beetle um we get them all over ours too and those are the good ones they're uh, very similar um that they will be good pollinators so those leave those be those are good ones <laughs> yeah any other questions anybody one person <laughs> yeah can you guys hear me yeah okay uh Kristen typed in the chat our FLS info at KCKPL if you are, you know, watching this on YouTube and have any questions for us, um, please email us at that or you can come visit us in person Monday through Friday 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and every third Saturday 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Wonderful. Thank well, you thank so you. Much. Thank you very much ladies for doing this wonderful presentation this presentation will be recorded and uploaded to the online programming blog under the heading critters in your garden the good and the bad so awesome. you can point to your acquaintances that there is such a wonderful <laughs> presentation to look at yes and thank you elena for um being our person doing everything like setting this up and facilitating it's my pleasure thank you thank you everybody and everybody have a great rest of your last day of summer yeah thank you bye-bye <laughs>